Hello and a very warm welcome back to my YouTube channel and today I want to talk about 10 dangers of buying real estate in England and Wales. Now I will be doing a program on London very very soon and perhaps some other cities in England and Wales but I think it's important to make this video because buying in England and Wales has quite unique um, things that you need to look out for. So let's get straight down to it. Number one, Realtors or estate agents act exclusively on behalf of the seller. So you've got to do a lot of legwork when buying um, a flat or a house in England and Wales. And unfortunately, a lot of um, real estate agents don't have a great reputation. Um, now, there are, some, there are some obviously good ones, but be mindful. They may try and sell you um, stock, which they, they've had on their books for many, many, many months and they cannot get rid of. So be very, very mindful of that. Number two, which is very important uh, when you buy, let's say, an apartment. Some apartments are share of freehold and some apartments are leasehold. So what does that mean? If you buy an apartment with a share of the freehold, it means you own part of the land and the building. But if you buy um, an apartment which is leasehold, you actually don't own any or a night of you in the block will own, let's say, the land or the building. It's owned by a separate uh, person, the freeholder, who in effect um, rents out that property to you for many, many years. Uh, and the leasehold could actually even be 999 years. But in effect, if you buy a flat with a lease in it, you're renting it for a certain number of years. Now, it shouldn't be a problem if um, the lease is many, many years. But if the lease is 80 years or less extending the lease, which you're entitled to do if, you li if you've lived in the property for two years, can be a bit of a minefield and it can cost you a lot of money and it can be very difficult to sell um, an apartment with a short lease. Now, if the lease is under 60 years, it is an absolute nightmare and I would avoid buying an apartment um, with that short lease. It will cost you less, but it's going to be a, a lot more expensive to extend the lease. I, I think if you're buying uh, an apartment in London, um, look for a lease, or London or anywhere else in England or Wales, look for a lease which is at least 100 to 125 years. So for many years, you will not have that headache. But the longer the lease, the better. Also do bear in mind, if an apartment is leasehold, um, the service charge, which I'll come to point three, is likely to be much higher simply because you have less of a say in how much repairs cost. So let's get on to point three, which is a service charge. Now, if you do buy an apartment in England and Wales, ask the estate agent and get proof. Look at for the lease, uh, hold the lease contract to see how much the service charge. You should do that anyway if if you buy an apartment which is share of freehold, but it's in particular more important if you buy an apartment which is leasehold, because I can give an example here in London, um, where one where recently I saw a one bedroom flat in Battersea, 40 square meters, and a one bedroom flat in Pimlico for 40 square meters. Both are equidistant from a prestigious area in London called um, Chelsea, uh, but the service charges on both were really, really different. So the one bedroom flat in Battersea, the service charge was um, £440 a year, but the one in Pimlico was £4,600 a year. So it's very, very important to ask how much the service charge is. And number four is actual the ground rent. Now this is what you pay to the freeholder, the one who actually owns the land and the building. And in many cases, it's a nominal, a nominal amount. So it's what we call peppercorn. Uh, it will cost, it could cost as little as 150 pounds a year. But what you need to look at in the, um, the lease contract is, can this be, can this be raised and by how much in the future? And how often do they look at raising it? And that I've known instances um, with ground rents where, the actual amount you can raise it by can be limitless. So you've got to be very, very careful with that as well. Number five is uh, what I call ex-council properties. So again, the real estate agent will not tell you if the property you're buying is council um, or if, if it's an ex-council or not. Now, ex-councils will cost a lot less than normal apartments, 
But you may think you've got yourself a deal, but do remember this, with an ex-counsel, you're gonna pay um, a lot higher uh, cost, let's say, if repairs are done, because many other people in the block of flats will be people who've been renting off the local authorities. Um, so be mindful of that. And it could be in the future, and particularly in the depressed market, you may have difficulty selling an ex-council property. Uh, number six, I wanna come to council tax. Now this is the tax, again, you pay to the local authorities, but it can, be, it can vary a lot uh, in areas where you buy. So for example, in London, um, if I take a bandy, which is typically a two bedroom apartment, in Wandsworth, which is one area of London, you'll pay in 2019, 2020, you would have paid 770 pounds a year. Whereas for example, in another area of London, another borough of London, I should say, Kingston, you would have paid 1,871 pounds. That's a difference of a um, thousand pounds a year, uh, approximately. That's a lot if taken over a number of years, let's say 10, 20 years. Number seven, uh, this relates specifically to um, houses. Um, you must have a survey done on a house in England and Wales simply because many of them suffer from dampness and, for example, leaking roofs. So if you don't have a survey done, I know surveys can cost uh, a fair bit of money, but they're worth having done even if you pay £3,000 for them because they can serve you a lot of trouble in the future. To repair a roof um, in England and Wales can cost you as much as £20,000. Or if there's rot or dampness, this can cost you many, many, many thousands of pounds. And I'm not just talking single digit numbers uh, in thousands. I'm talking about double digit numbers. So it's worth getting that survey done. And I want to go back as well. Be careful with the house because in 99% of the cases, houses are freehold places. But there are houses as well which are leasehold, in particular in London. So be, be mindful of that as well. Number eight, uh, another danger is the length of time. So uh, it can take a long time between actually making a bid on a property and actually completing. On average, uh, in England and Wales, it takes between six to eight weeks, but it can take up to eight months. And do bear in mind, even if you make a bid on a property, in one in four cases, this can often fall through because you may have a chain where you're relying on buyers, relying on another buyer to complete. So be mindful of that. Uh, it's, it's, it, may, it may even, as I said, it may even take several months to complete and you may be disappointed as well when somebody pulls out. Number nine, I want to um, come on to something which I think is quite scandalous and which is pretty unique to England and Wales, which is gazumping. Now this happens when another buyer offers more money during the process between uh, making a bid and completing on a property. They offer more money than you and the seller reneges on the deal. Uh, and this often happens, let's say, in a rising market. Now you may think, okay, all that's gonna happen is we're going through the process, but um, they renege on the deal. It's bad luck for me, but I haven't lost anything but you may well lose on things. So for example, this can happen even when you've paid the solicitor and even when you've done a survey on let's say a house or, or even a flat, uh, you could have paid let's say the solicitor several thousand and done the survey on a flat. So see if there's any problems with the roof, etc. And you may have paid several thousand and you will lose, you will actually lose the money. And you might think if you're buying, if you're from another country, how can this be in a so-called first world countries like England and Wales. Well, I'm afraid it is scandalous, but it does happen. And the only mitigate, the only thing you can do to mitigate this is, for example, when you've made a bid, insist on the seller taking the property off the market. But there's no guarantees here. And I'm afraid you've got to be prepared to lose some money if this happens. Um, number, finally, number 10, I want to come on to what I call school catchment areas. Now, in the US, they're, they're a lot more familiar than, for example, in countries in Europe, let's say France, Italy, etc. But you may find on one side of the street, uh, an, uh, let's say an apartment, let's take in London, can cost half a million pounds. And then on the other side of the street, it costs 650,000. You may think, well, they're in exactly really the same areas. Why are they costing a lot more? Well, the reason is, is because one side of the street um, uh, has what is known as a school catchment area where they can send their children to a good state school, whereas the other side, 
uh, of the street where the property is a lot less, um, they're forced either to send their children to a state school which is not considered anywhere near as good as state school catchments on the other side of the street and they may be forced to pay for their children private school education which um, unfortunately in England and Wales is very expensive and for a, each child can cost 20 to 25,000 pounds a year. So again, you've got to be mindful of this when you're buying in England and Wales. Anyway, I hope this video has been useful. If you found it useful, please do click the like button. Please, if you like my channel, please subscribe and I'll see you very soon on the next video. Bye for today.